Hi, this is Nick Forster. This week in E-Town, we're going to revisit one of our favorite shows, and it starts right now. Live from E-Town Hall in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, it's E-Town with this week's guests. From Southern California, Chris Hillman and Herb Peterson, paleontologist Kenneth Lacovera, and from Durham, North Carolina, his golden messenger. I'm Helen Forster. Join me right now in welcoming our host, if you would, Nick Forster. Thank you, Helen. Thanks, everybody. Welcome to E-Town Hall. We meet again. So I could be wrong, but I have a feeling this is going to be a good one this week. We've got all the elements. We've got a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer, a musician, singer, and songwriter from California whose voice has been part of the American musical history as a founding member of the Birds, the Flying Burrito Brothers, Manassas, Souther Hillman Fury Band, the Desert Rose Band. Chris Hillman is here. And um, with the also experienced and venerable and accomplished and remarkable Herb Peterson. So a very dynamic duo. Those guys are here. We've got a world-class paleontologist. Kenneth Lacovara is here, who, among other things, is responsible for finding and naming the world's largest dinosaur, nine times bigger than a T-Rex. Kenneth is here to talk about the relevance of dinosaurs today. We've also got another seasoned performer who's actually oddly kind of a newcomer in some ways. The band Hiss Golden Messenger is here. They have, um, they have recently uh, put out their ninth studio record. And this is not even the first band for uh, MC Taylor, the singer and songwriter for the band. But they have been road warriors. They are now uh, reaching a bigger audience than ever with good reason. Great songs, soulful production, great live shows. It's all coming together. And we're glad they're here. So let's get started. Please welcome to E-Town for the first time, His Golden Messenger.
Here's what you're gonna do when the hunger's gone. When the hunger's gone. Yes, baby, the child goes with her. I goes with her. Well, give him no reason to falter. On his way there. It's a beautiful world, a painful child. I'll tear it down, I'll tear it down You step back, Jack, from the dark end When I'm here I'm gonna sing just like a song Afraid of the darkness 
Just a different kind of light Where you're trying to tell me something What did it rain? It didn't thunder Yes, baby, the high When you were caught under Were you trying to break my heart? That sounds good. That sounds good, and it feels good. Thank you. I don't know what took us we're so glad long. To be, well, we, yeah, we, it took us a while to get here, but yeah. we're, we're glad to be here. I played Jazz Fest a couple weeks ago, and just being in New Orleans and being in that scene, um, we played on the Fado Do stage. I don't know what stage you were on. As did we. Oh, wow. Yeah, the Isn't best it, stage. It's the best stage, I think so, too. <laughs> the best stage. It's maybe not the biggest, but it's the best. No, but biggest is never best. Yeah. Well, occasionally it's best. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, what a town and what a thing. What I did, of course, whenever I go to Jazz Fest, is I gravitate over to the gospel tent. Yeah, so do we. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wacky thing, and I, I'm curious, you know, when I think about gospel music that turns me on and has for years, you know, of course, there's the Staple Singers, and there's the Blind Boys of Alabama, or there's Sister Rosetta Tharp, or there's Dorothy Love Coates, or there's, you know, these iconic joyful black gospel singers that mm-hmm. really speak to me. But there's no white gospel singers that connect for me somehow. And I'm just curious about, I'm trying to get rid of all my prejudices one by one. And I wonder if it's a prejudice or if it's just not that good. <laughs> well, it's, it's different music. It's different music. Same themes, different understandings about how rhythm works. Right. I'm not putting white gospel groups down. I mean, the Oak Ridge Boys made some pretty incredible records early on, but they're not the same thing. Yeah. So let me ask you about, you are a California guy originally. Yeah. I I grew up in Southern California, actually not far from where Chris Hillman was. Yeah. You were in Irvine and he was just a little farther south. Yeah, exactly right. Was there a thing that happened like a a sibling that gave you a record? Because I get the feeling that you're in. This music world is not just something you're dabbling in. This is just, you're in. And well, I, I think to have the kind of career, or whatever career in quotes, whatever we call the thing that we yeah. do, I don't think that we can dabble in it. I think we have to be totally in the deep end with right. it. And I mean, it took me a long time to get to that point. I worked full-time day, day jobs, jobs for yeah. most of my life. I yeah. don't anymore, but I did for... I, I know about day jobs well. Did you have any uh, interesting ones? I'd say my best day job was selling bikinis over the phone. <laughs> and how long do you think I lasted? That's, um, that's a good one. I don't think I've ever even imagined that job. I mean, that's just like, I don't even know if I want that thought. I don't think it's kind of like coal mining. It doesn't really exist anymore. (laughs) (laughs) So um, I'm sure there were other things about growing up in Southern California that were more pleasant than that. But what I was actually curious about was, was there a thing as as you're growing up, was there a moment with like an older sibling or a friend or somebody that gave you a record or you heard something on the radio or there was a moment where you said, oh, okay. Now I know. If that hadn't happened, you wouldn't have made this right turn. And Yeah, definitely. Well, first of all, my dad is a musician. Yeah, he was in a band. So he played a lot of music then, and that was when the folk revival was in full swing. And he was sort of in the scene, but he didn't quite have the fortitude in that way to go out and become a musician for life. But he always played around the house. He has an absolutely beautiful voice, nothing like my voice. And he has um, an incredible D28, Martin D28, which is like a nice, beautiful guitar. Right. Um, so I grew up hearing that, you know, all the time and hearing him sing. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then you relocated to North Carolina. Yeah. 
And so you're now part of a little North Carolina community, it sounds like. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty I mean, cool music scene. It really is. There is an incredible wealth of music there. And, you know, it put me in the South, which was really important to me. I yeah. felt like I had reached a level with my love of sort of vernacular music and culture from the South that made me think, if I'm going to go any deeper with this, I feel like I need to live there. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, just congratulations. The, the record, the new record's really good. All, you know, and the combination of uh, imagery and songwriting, you know, you're tapping into something very cool, and the band sounds amazing. Thank you. So we're going to hear more. Welcome back, if you would, His Golden Messenger.
Thank you. That's his golden messenger from Durham, North Carolina. The record's called Hallelujah Anyhow out on Merge Records. MC Taylor on vocals and guitar. Phil Cook on guitar and piano and vocals. Michael Libramento on the bass and the vocals. JT Bates on the drums. They will be back to play some more music later on in the show. This portion of E-Town is made possible by the Bohemian Foundation, building stronger communities through the Bohemian qualities of creativity and imagination. On the web at bohemianfoundation.org. As a reminder for your viewing pleasure, there are over 2,000 videos on the E-Town YouTube channel, where you can also subscribe in order to stay up to date with our latest offerings. And if you're curious about E-Town's home base, E-Town Hall, our beautiful solar-powered music venue, community center, and recording studio located in downtown Boulder, Colorado, you can learn more about it on our website, etown.org. You're listening to E-Town. Nick Forster, you're listening to E-Town. His Golden Messenger will be back later on in the show. And coming up from Southern California, we've got the remarkable Chris Hillman along with Herb Peterson. They are here. But before we bring them out, we get a chance every week to take a break from the music and talk about basically how we treat each other and how we treat the natural world. Often uh, it's stories of people doing remarkable things in their communities. And sometimes we get to visit with authors or scientists or policymakers who know an awful lot about something relevant, and that is what's happening uh, this week. We're going to learn more about dinosaurs. So here comes Helen Forster to tell you more. Thank you, Nick. Kenneth Lacavara is an American paleontologist and geologist who spent decades looking for dinosaur fossils all over the world. And he's found them, more than a few big ones, in fact, including his recent discovery of the Dreadnoughtus, the world's largest dinosaur. He's the founding dean of the School of Earth and Environment at Rowan University in New Jersey, and he's the director of the Edelman Fossil Park, which he helped create. He's a fellow in the prestigious Explorers Club of New York, and his book, why Dinosaurs Matter helps put our planet's natural history and our current status in perspective. Kenneth is a frequent contributor to documentaries and television programs. He's a lecturer and guest speaker, and I happen to know personally he's a really good drummer, too. So we're really happy to have him with us this week. So please join me in welcoming to E-Town Kenneth Lacavara. I could tell you were checking out that rhythm section during that last musical section. <laughs> I was indeed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Kenneth. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. The, the book is called Why Dinosaurs Matter. Mm -hmm. We're going to touch on that first. I want to just ask you a little bit about how you look for dinosaurs. Tell us a little bit about how you manage to find them and how you look for them. Yeah, so dinosaurs lived only during a certain geological time period. So you have to find rocks of the right age. And those rocks have to be sedimentary rocks so that a fossil can form. And then it's very helpful today if that's a desert. Yeah. So what kind of deserts did you start going to? Well, I've worked in Egypt in the Sahara Desert in this lonely place called the Bahariya Oasis. There we found a, a dinosaur that we later named Paralatitan, which at the time was the second largest dinosaur. Wow. Done some work in the uh, foothills in the Himalayas, in the uh, Gobi Desert in China. And then I've spent most of my time down in southernmost Patagonia near Tierra del Fuego in uh, Argentina, and that's where I discovered Dreadnoughtus. Wow. You're kind of looking at a time machine. You're seeing mm -hmm. all these things that happened, and you're being able to sort of analyze and, and explore the history of the planet, basically, mm -hmm. through these rock layers. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, do you bump into surprise events or things that you think, 
this looks like there was a spike in temperature in this era, or this looks like there was moisture here that didn't used to be here. This looks like, you know, do you see that kind of stuff too? Sure. Earth history is nothing but a series of surprises. And the rock record is how we know that history. And so you'll be in a place and you'll see, oh, the sea level rose at this point, or there was a tsunami there, or the levees on this river broke and it killed all the local animals. And so, you know, I, I get to time travel. Yeah. And of course you must get a sense that it's all about just this simple twist of fate. Like, had something not gone one way or another, none of this would be here. It's all so contingent. You know, the Earth doesn't have to have humans any more than it has to have dinosaurs. There are an infinite number of histories that we could have had, and of course yeah. we only get one, and it seems like a really good one because it led to us and E-Town and you and me and all these yeah. lovely people out here. Um, but it didn't have to be this way. Yeah. And the rock record tells us that there are really an infinite number of points where Earth history could have just veered into another direction. And, you know, that history would have also been improbable and I'm sure amazing, but it wouldn't have been our history. Yeah, that's wild. So, uh, I, Dreadnoughtus. Yes. How much do you think this thing weighed when it was walking around? Well, all fleshed out, it would have weighed about 65 tons. So that's 13 bull African elephants. That's nine T-Rex. That's about 10 tons heavier than a Boeing 737. I imagine it has a pretty wide legs. Well, <laughs> these guys actually, they have a wide gauge stance. They kind of walk around like bulldogs um, for added stability because if you're 65 tons, the penalty for falling over is death. Oh, wow. <laughs> Um, so let me talk a little bit about your book now. Mm -hmm. So why dinosaurs matter. Yes. I think in probably it's true, but dinosaurs get a bad rap, right? They do get a bad rap. I mean, uh, if you open any of the major English dictionaries and look at the definition of dinosaur, you'll have the biological definition. Number two is always something like someone or something that was unable to cope with changing conditions. And so, you know, this isn't just a, a colloquialism. We have actually yeah. codified dinosaurs as losers. Right. Um, <laughs> And it's not the case. So dinosaurs dominated Earth's terrestrial ecosystems for 165 million years. They were doing great. Their biodiversity was expanding. They were on every continent. And then they got murdered. Yeah. <laughs> they got murdered by a giant Asteroid. rock from yeah. space. If that rock didn't hit, if you would have taken a piece of popcorn four billion years ago and hit that rock with it, it misses the Earth 65 million years ago. And us humans, we, our ancestors were little tiny shrew-like creatures at the time that spent all their time living in the hidden and forgotten recesses of the dinosaur world, trying to stay away from dinosaurs their whole life. That's still us today if that rock doesn't hit the planet. Wild. And then, you know, not all the dinosaurs went extinct. Birds are dinosaurs. And I don't mean they evolved from dinosaurs or they're related to dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs. And they're dino Birds are dinosaurs. Birds are full-fledged dinosaurs. Okay. Yeah. I gotta think about that for a minute. Because... They have the first dinosaur for an ancestor. And just like in your family, if you all descend from great-great-grandmother Polly, you're in the Polly family, right? And if you have the first dinosaur for an ancestor, you're a dinosaur. And who has the first dinosaur for an ancestor? T-Rex and Allosaurus and Stegosaurus and ruby-throated hummingbirds and penguins and parakeets and flamingos. Wild. They are dinosaurs to the same degree that a T-Rex is a dinosaur. That's wild. Okay. I'll ponder that. Um, <laughs> Let me fast forward a little bit to today. Again, in your book, you're talking about why dinosaurs matter. One reason, of course, is context and just understanding that mm -hmm. what happened to them was not uh, through their own mismanagement of their environment. The fifth mass extinction took place because of an event that they had nothing to do with. That's right. So people talk now about the sixth mass extinction, mm -hmm. which is something that maybe we've got a hand in. And unlike the dinosaurs, as you say, they got a bad rap, we see this coming a little bit. We should see it coming. Uh, you know, the, we're warming the climate, we're acidifying the oceans, which is killing the coral reefs. We're losing a, a, a football field of rainforest every second. During your show here, six species on planet Earth will go extinct. And to paleontologists in the future, if there is such a thing, this is going to look like the world's sixth mass extinction. Only the difference is, as you say, we can see it coming and we can do something about it. And so, you know, the dinosaurs aren't the paragons of failure. They're the great champions of an entire Earth era, which extends until today, if you include the birds. So really the question is, can we do 
as well as the dinosaurs? Can we be as adaptable, as resilient, and as persistent as these long-lasting champions of Earth history? Right. So what are we going to do? Well, you know, I think we need to look to the past to plot a course to the future. We can see how Earth ecosystems respond to perturbations and to calamities. We can see um, what happens when temperatures rise, when sea level rises. So it's really all that information is in the past, and we'd be foolish and arrogant yeah. not to learn from it. Right. I just quickly want to see if my supposition is correct, which is that the irony here is that fossil fuels are the issue and that we have an opportunity to move beyond them, if not an obligation to move beyond them in the coming decades, right? We're going to move beyond them. Yeah. It's a finite resource. So the question is, you know, do we get off it now? Do we get off of them in 100 years or 200 years? But there will be a time when that stuff is used up. Geology makes more, but not in a time frame that is useful to humans. So if you look at the entire span of human history, there's just going to be this tiny little interval when we were a fossil fuel society. That's going to end. So let's make it end sooner to preserve what we have for longer. Thank you so much for being here. Kenneth LaCavara, the book is called Why Dinosaurs Matter. He's got some great talks online. If you want more information, just go to etown.org. Thanks, Kenneth. To our listeners, if you want to learn more about Kenneth LaCavara and his book and his work, you can find more information about him on our website, etown.org. And you know, we always love to hear from our listeners. If you'd like to comment on this conversation or the show in general, we'd love to hear from you. So uh, you can connect with us through social media. You can send an email to info at etown.org. Or if you so choose, you can write to us the old fashioned way at box 954, Boulder, Colorado, 80306. All right. We have got um, more music coming up from his golden messenger in a little while. Right now, let me tell you about our next guest. Chris Hillman was in the belly of the beast when the Southern California sound was born. He uh, started out playing bluegrass, and then pretty soon he got in the little group of friends and, of course, became deep in it. He's founding member of the Birds. Absolutely fresh sound. And then, of course, with the record Sweethearts of the Rodeo with... Clarence White and Grant Parsons and the band pretty much just created country rock and influenced so many other musicians and other bands. Of course, then came the Flying Burrito Brothers and then Manassas with Stephen Stills, an amazing collaboration that didn't last, but they made some great music. Souther Hillman Fury Band, the Desert Rose Band, Birds Reunions, other projects all along the way. He's now here with his buddy, Herb Peterson, who is equally uh, star-studded. His resume is amazing. He's played or recorded with everybody from John Fogarty and the Dillards and Grant Parsons and Emmy Lou Harris and Stephen Stills and Linda Ronstadt and Chris Christopherson and John Prine and Jackson Brown and John Denver. I mean, the list is just endless, but two super talented guys who've been friends for decades, and uh, we're so glad that they're here. Please welcome back to E-Town, Chris Hillman and Herb Peterson. <laughs> Thank you, Nick, so much. Very kind. Oh, what will you give me? Say the sad bells of rib me. Is there hope for the future? Say the brown bells of birth. Who made the mine owner? Say the black bells of Rhonda And who killed the miner Say the green bells of Blind Oh, the vandals in court Say the bells of So worry, sisters, why? Say the silver bells of white. And what will you give me? Say 
the sad bells of me Is there hope for the future? Say the brown bells of Bertha Who made the mine owner? Say the black bells of Rhonda everybody so much so this is a song off a new album I did that Herb Peterson and Tom Petty put together for me it's called given all I can see are we ready by the way ladies and gentlemen joining us our good friend Sally Van Meter on the dope Watch, a wonderful musician a one two three Given all I can see, given all that I feel, given all that's before me, it seems so unreal. I pray my hope to be still. Will the righteous still stand when evil strikes us land? False promises and lies We've been given all we need to survive Chris Hillman, welcome back to E-Town. 
Thank you, Nick. Glad you're here. This new record, Biding My Time, you have been doing anything but that, it seems. You've been a busy guy. What a blessing. Uh, yeah. We went into the studio in January of 2017. And I will tell you all, I knew Tom since 1978. I really got to know him over a two-month period. I have yet to meet Nick, a more humble person in his position. Yeah. Seriously. And you forget that he was such a huge worldwide rock star in that sense, loved music, had the same band with him and the same crew for 40 years. Somewhat like Hot Rise being together for 40 years, and that's a feat unto itself. Well, thank right? you. Thanks, yeah. Chris. But yeah, I, I totally got that feeling with not knowing him. I didn't know him, never mm -hmm. met him, but I got the sense that he was like a musician's musician and that yeah. he really, he would just as soon get in the van and go load the PA and do all the stuff because exactly. he knows yeah. that that's what it takes to play, <laughs> play for an audience. He came out and took my guitars in one day. He had a staff of people in his house in Malibu and he would bring the coffee in with the cups. Yeah. And going, so, you know, Amazing. Okay. Wonderful man. And how was Tom as producer? Was he hands-on once you chose the songs? and Somewhat hands-on, but not... He just let it go, and once in a while he would say, I don't hear that. Right. And that was his way of saying, we don't need to do this, and that was great. He was a fantastic producer. He really got yeah. performance, which is yeah. really n wonderful. Well, you have not lost a lick as a singer, and you have that voice that's just so clear. You know, it's, it's a bluegrass. <laughs> Thank no, you very much. A... <laughs> Thank you very much. It's recognizable. You don't, um, you know, like a lot of singers have vibrato. You don't seem to have vibrato in your repertoire. No, I'm starting to come sometimes, but yeah. uh, I learned from the best. I learned from Crosby and McGuinn, Gene Clark and Stephen Stills. And, you know, and then finally, it was really a lack of confidence in the early days. I could sing in tune, but it meant nothing. And you sort of develop, that's another instrument you develop. Yeah. yeah. Well, in bluegrass, of course, singing parts, you know, you were able yeah. to hit the high tenor yeah, and yeah. be able to do that. That's a rare skill, too. Um, so many characters, so many stories. And, of course, I was talking to the paleontologist about mm -hmm. all the... It's uh... <laughs> a good line. I don't know what... That was good. <laughs> I can remember the correlation here, but we're going to get there. <clears throat> don't worry. I'm ah. not going to call him a dinosaur. Oh, I don't care. I've been calling no, him. No, I'm just Go going to say, we were talking about all the things that had to line up for these things to happen, for this path to just unfold the way it did. And it must be that way for you. Like, is it true that your sister brought you a new Lost City Ramblers record that helped sort of turn Actually, she brought me the Weavers and Woody Guthrie and Cisco Houston oh, wow. and Lead Belly, which I loved. And then I discovered the Ramblers before Bluegrass, believe it or not. I yeah. saw Mike Seeger playing that F5 mail, and I went, um, hmm, that's what I wanted to learn to do. Yeah. yeah. And you also had the community that kind of gathered around the club in L.A. called the Ashgrove. Yeah, that's right. It was very small. Nick, I mean, Ry Cooter, Herb Peterson would be down from Berkeley, David Lindley. And it was a very small group of people that had a passion for traditional music. Yeah. And yeah. when you go there, you would see one night it would be Ralph Stanley, one night yeah, it would be... It would be. We'd drive know. 150 miles to see Flat and Scruggs and or the Stanley Brothers, Light and Hopkins, Doc Watson. Fantastic. What yeah. a great, you know, that was just it. And it was a small room, right? Yeah, it was a small room. Like 100 people or something yeah, like that? Yeah, exactly. Amazing. <laughs> well, um, well, listen, I, I think it's been an, uh, a remarkable journey, and you got to, you know, reunite with John Jorgensen and, mm -hmm. and hang out with your buddies. I was touched by the fact that you dedicated the record to our mutual friend Bill Bryson, yeah. bass yeah. player in Desert Rose, but yeah. also somebody who was in that scene for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, last thing I want to talk about before we go back to music, did you fare okay in all the fires and mudslides and chaos that was going on mm -hmm. in your neighborhood in California? <laughs> no. We live in Ventura, California. Big fire out there, as you know. And we live up on the hillside, and, and we see the entire coast, and beautiful, beautiful neighborhood. And so that night of December 4th, which was my birthday, mm -hmm. my wife says, I smell smoke. I go outside, and the ridge across from our house is on fire. And it's 70 mile an hour winds. I mean, it's like blowing. So... We got out with most important things, my Lloyd Lower mandolin, my D28 that was a gift to me from my first mentor from high school, and I got those out. I got important papers and got in the car, and we got down that hill, and we're watching that thing. I said, this is going to go into the city of Ventura and wipe it out. And the next morning, I said to my wife, all right, we might not have our house, but we're alive. We go up there get through the lines and stuff, and there's our house, by the grace of God, standing there and ruin around us. It looked like a Syrian bombed city. It was horrible. So yeah, it's been chaotic. We're not in our house yet. We lost our kitchen, but I can't sit and go, oh my gosh, but the other people lost everything. I mean, a friend of mine, neighbor, no ID, nothing. Wow. 
But we're, we're, we're fine. We're dealing with it. Well, you're a, a survivor, if nothing else, Chris. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks again for coming back. Thanks for making another record. And thanks for bringing her with you because we love hanging oh, out with both of you. Thank you, Nick, and, yeah. and your beautiful wife, Helen, for having us back. Yeah. We appreciate this. Well, let's, very much. let's play some more music. You know it. Okay. Welcome back, Herb Peterson and Chris Hillman. We'd like to have Nick come out and play with us on this song. It's uh... This is a song that's on the new album, and Roger McGuinn and I wrote this in 1979 and never recorded it. And the only time I heard it was a live tape. Somebody taped us in back east somewhere at a concert, and I went, gosh, I really someday hope we can do it. It really is reminiscent of the early 64 Beatles, birds, that particular sound. Here she comes again. Goes like this. Thank you, folks, so much. Here she comes again. Oh, I fall in once before. I just can't help myself. Tillman. Chris Hillman, along with Herb Peterson, Sally Van Meter, and E Tones, Chris Engelman, Christian Teal, Ron Jolly, Helen Forster. The record's called Biden My Time. Your visit to E-Town is made possible in part by the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, or SCFD, one of the largest cultural funding mechanisms in the United States, supporting nearly 300 organizations in the greater Denver area, and by our diverse family of NPR affiliates and community stations, plus college and commercial stations, as well as our international stations and podcast subscribers worldwide. Thank you for your continued support. You're listening to E-Town. I'm Nick Forster. I'd like to say hello to our listeners who hear E-Town on stations like KEGR in Concord, California, on WMSV in Starkville, Mississippi, and on WOUB in Athens, Ohio. 
As always, if you want some more information about E-Town or you want to see some of the thousands of great videos from all the music you're hearing on the radio, all that stuff is available online at etown.org. We covered some ground. We talked about the fact that, but for the simple twist of fate, none of us would be here, of course, because dinosaurs would rule the planet and we'd be just little moles crawling around in the dirt hiding from them. Um, we learned that also it doesn't take much for these musical paths and musical careers to be set in motion. And we learned, I think, from Kenneth that we can learn from history and we can make things better if we get involved. So that's cool. Right now, would you help me welcome back to the stage his golden messenger? We're going to play a song now called Caledonia, and we're honored to have Nick and Helen Forrester out here with us to play it. Let's give them a hand. Yes, Caledonia, my love, won't you come in? Twelve pieces of silver and gold in your teeth Said good King John, many fathoms deep From the fire of the morning to the blood of the evening Yes, Caledonia, my love won't you come to me? Twelve pieces of silver and gold in your teeth. Said the one and one with a dark eyed heel. Oh, he lives in wild places and he don't know you. Yes, the batters of the angels. I sit and cry for nothing Yes, I'm dying in the rush yeah. Yes, Caledonia, my love Won't you come Well, this is a silver I'm gold in your teeth Said the mother and father With a child of three Oh, freedom ain't nothing When you've never been free Oh, Caledonia, my love Won't you come to me Twelve pieces of silver I'm gold in your teeth Said the lonely child, little Rosalie Our freedom ain't nothing unless you've been free yeah. It's this golden messenger, folks. MC Taylor, Phil Cook, Michael Libramento, and J.T. Bates. The record's called Hallelujah Anyhow on Merge Records here from Durham, North Carolina. We've got time for one more song. I want to get uh, Chris Hillman and Herb Peterson, get everybody back out on stage for this last number. We talked about how the fact that, that uh, Tom Petty was involved in making Chris's recent record, so we figured we'd do a Tom Petty tune for you now. I want to thank all our guests. Thanks to Chris Hillman and Herb Peterson coming out from California. Thanks to Kenneth Lacavara, paleontologist and author, helping us understand why dinosaurs matter. Thanks to his golden messenger coming out from North Carolina. Thanks to all of you for joining us in E-Town. I'm Nick Forster. Hope you can be with us next week right here 
in E-Town. Produced by a donor supported nonprofit organization. To make an Achievement Award nomination or comment on the show in general, feel free to visit our website, etown.org, or contact us through Twitter or our two Facebook pages. Run away, here, go find a lover. Run away, let your heart be. You deserve the deepest of color. Distribution of E-Town is made possible by our family of sponsors, this station, and listeners like you. You belong among the wildflowers. You belong somewhere close to me. Far away from your troubles and worries You belong somewhere you feel free You belong somewhere you feel free This is a production of E-Town.